My guest today is Jamal Reimer. And honestly, Jamal is not someone who needs a lot of introduction. If you're studying the game of sales right now and you're on LinkedIn, you've probably already seen some of Jamal's content out there. He is an expert in closing mega deals. And when I say mega deals, we're talking $10 million, $50 million contracts. So I reached out to Jamal uh, and I'm super excited that he, he was able to come on the show and share a little bit more about his journey from being an underperforming account executive to closing uh, $160 million in software revenue over the course of his career. Uh, we talk in this episode today about the mindset shift that takes place, uh, as well as some of the skills that one needs to develop if they want to increase their deal size. And part of that is being able to sell the value of your solution to executive level stakeholders. Uh, there's talk about how to best manage RFPs, which is something that everyone has encountered. Everyone who's worked in enterprise sales has encountered at one point or another, how to win an RFP or how to position yourself for a victory uh, in an RFP process. Uh, we, we discussed uh, just all kinds of different topics. I'm um, again, super excited to have him on the show as someone who's personally trying to, to learn how to exponentially increase their average deal sizes. Uh, he's someone that I was really excited to, to bring out and, and have on the, on the podcast. So without further ado, this is Jamal. Thanks so much for, for being on the show today. Thanks for having me, Jesse. Awesome. Random question. First off, I, I noticed you're based in Sweden. What's your connection? Are you Swedish or what's your connection to, to Sweden? My wife. <laughs> So uh, I, I met my wife when I was living in D.C. Uh -huh. and she was visiting her sister who was in, in nearby in Virginia and she's a physician and we started dating very long distance. Long mm -hmm. story short, a year later, we decided to get married and I moved to Sweden for her because of her career. It's actually a goal of mine to go and live abroad, probably in Europe for some amount of time. My wife and I have talked about that a lot, how because we're both from here, we're both from the States, the you know specifically both from Arizona. Uh, and then spend some time in Texas. But we've talked about finding a nice European country and spending a couple of years there just to experience a, a different quality of life and a different walk of life, if you will. So how do you like Sweden overall? I mean, you know, it's it, there's great things and there's challenging things. The great things are, you know, everything works. Uh, yeah. It's very forward thinking in terms of technology. There are Teslas everywhere. <laughs> it's, I've it's heard that, things. yeah. Teslas and, 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 and MacBooks and, and iPhones, the whole bit. Um, uh, the taxes are very high, mm -hmm. uh, but the standard of living is also very high. So there, there are very few people who are like super wealthy, but there are very, you know, comparatively, especially with like with places like the US, the, the distance between the rich and the poor is not very great at all. And that's pretty awesome. Um, so on the downside, the, 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 the people are a little hard to get to know sometimes. And the weather is, of course, not, not the best. It's like where I live, it's like UK weather. So there's a lot Ooh. of overcast days, you know, some, a lot of rain, yeah. uh, long winters and very dark winters. So th that's turning around now. Here we are in, you know, um, February. Big brief, it's February already. And it's know, crazy. The, the, the light is coming back. So there's, an, there's light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. And where are you from originally here in the States? I grew up in North Carolina. Nice. Okay. Yeah, that's another place. Wow. Okay. Cool. And then it sounds like you made your way to DC at some point. Is that where you started your SAS career? Oh, after university, I went many places. I lived in Latin America, spent a summer in China. Most of the major US cities uh, is where I really got into the SAS business. Wow. So tell us about that. What, and you don't have to go all the way back. I know you have obviously someone with a lot of experience and I, you know, just for context for the listeners, I recently attended a, a webinar that Jamal put on uh, and he shared a little bit about his background and uh, how his career sort of shifted at, at a certain point. And I'll, I'll let you get into that yourself. Uh, you'll, you'll tell it a lot better than I can, uh, but maybe tell us, you know, how you landed in, in software sales. I know a lot of the listeners are, are either new to the career field or they're pursuing a career in software. Uh, tell us that story a little bit. Well, I think it was quite different than a much more common trajectory into SaaS now. Today, it's a very developed um, uh, vocation, you know, and, and today it's very common to start as something like a BDR, SDR, then inside AE, then enterprise, and, you know, you work your way up through this kind of steady progression. 
Um, it was very early days before it wasn't even SaaS. It, there was software, yeah. it was on premise software, you know, back in the day. Right. And I got into it uh, kind of in a back ended way. So I was a co founder of a, a startup that failed after two years. And after it failed, I was like, well, what the heck am I going to do now? I, I used to be in banking before that, I was in private oh. banking. And um, yeah. after, after catching the, the startup bug and then crashing and burning, I was like, I don't want to go back to that old life. What, what am I going to do now? And right. I just happened to be networking and I got in touch with somebody that connected me with a CEO and his right-hand man. And we went to lunch and they needed somebody who had a financial services background. And, and I became an AE like right there and right then. That's awesome. Yeah. I know when I started and I'm, I'm about 10 years into the career field now, even then it was, it was crazy to think about someone finishing college and going to take a role, making cold calls as either an SDR or a, you know, small business seller. It just wasn't, it definitely wasn't the profession, the, the glamorous profession that it is now. And now you see on message boards and Reddit and things like that, tons of questions about how to break into SaaS or, you know, should I get into consulting, investment banking, or SaaS sales? That <laughs> blows my mind. Cause I remember back in college thinking, oh man, being an iBanker or a consultant, that's like, I just don't have the resume for that. So I'm going to go here and, and make a bunch of phone calls and, and land in a sales pit and see if I can climb the ranks. And I've shared this story before. I remember Googling early in my career, you know, how do you make the most money as a seller? <laughs> what industry, you know, can you make the biggest commission checks in and enterprise sales popped up? But even then, you know, software as a service was still, you know, it was definitely uh, taking off at that point. And a lot of the managers I've worked for came from that on-premise era where they started their career selling big enterprise, you know, multi-million dollar solutions that were all installed on-premise and it wasn't, you know, in the cloud and they were big, you know, big presentations that you do on site and they take 18 months to close a deal. And it's, it's fun to see the industry where it is now, where, you have companies like Zoom and you know whoever else that are just these high velocity software companies, um, but also the you know the major sort of infrastructure ERP uh, you know enterprise resource planning and CRM type tools that just have so much potential. There are so many flavors of of enterprise sellers now, and yeah. it, it's a now it's become such a varied um, you know it's it's an ecosystem of its own. And, you know, I, I, the last now 14 years of, uh, now let's say 11, the last 11 years of my career have been in a very, very small niche, which is pharma, R and D, IT, <laughs> pharma, R and D tech. And there's a number of players and it, and it is its own little fiefdom of players and you know there's one flavor of a seller you know in, in a niche area then there are the behemoth uh verticals you know crm as you mentioned, erp um lots of transactional systems that are horizontal across the database right the whole world of cloud now you know that you got the amazon reps and google and microsoft and oracle and ibm that you know that's a whole flavor then there are the, the early stage startups, then there's the mid stage startups, then there's the late startups. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's a big world out there now. Yeah. It's, it's really crazy. Tons of opportunity. Uh, so one of the reasons that I started following your content is you, you've really, you know, you've walked the walk of being a contributor for decades, right? At this point. And I have a lot of respect for that. Cause that's, uh, I, I toggle back and forth in my own mind between, I could probably just be a rep forever, especially when you talk about getting up the chain with larger and larger deal sizes. It, it's fun. And it's, it's never a dull moment. You're meeting new people all the time. You're helping major enterprises solve major complex problems. And in some cases that, that can be a lot more rewarding than managing a team of reps or having to, you know, report to a board of directors or something like that. Now I know you just recently assumed your first leadership role, uh, but again, one of the reasons I, I jumped on the bandwagon and started following your content is I just love the, the experience you've had as a, as a contributor for so long. You've really, you seem to have gotten deep into the, the techniques and you've really, really perfected the craft. So tell us about, you know, what that journey was like. And I know there was probably some bumps along the way. Uh, anything else you sort of learned as just a, an individual contributor in the software business? Yeah. So 
Um, I guess my first decade of sales was more bumps than flight. You know, <laughs> um, I, I worked for a series of early to mid stage startups and had very dubious levels of success to the point where there was a phase in my career where I was fired twice in a row for okay. underperformance. And I, it, it, I just, I couldn't get it. I was like, you know, I can make the calls and I can do the pitch, but it never seems to stick. And I can't, I can't really progress things. And it just got to the point where I was like, is this, is this for me? You know, am I, am I cut out for this stuff? Other people seem to do it. And I'm just like, you know, struggling so hard. And then somehow I got a job in big old Oracle and I, I was selling CRM back when Siebel was still a viable thing. This is before, you know, Salesforce. Yeah. And, um, I, I, I caught a break my first year where there was an inbound lead for an RFP and I hate RFPs, but you know, spoiler alert, we, we won. And it was a, it was big one and, and big for me. It was like $2.5 million. Um, and then for years, it was still up and down after that. And again, not to go on too long. Um, I was brought into an account uh, this is a after making my, uh, you know, I, I live in, I live in Sweden and I moved here for my wife and I did it while I was working for Oracle. So I it was two years at Oracle in the mid Atlantic. And then I moved and went to a different part of Oracle, but I, I was still with Oracle when I, when I came to Sweden mm -hmm. and I was put on this account that was doing run rate business, you know, nothing huge. Uh, well, it was 10 million every three years. And in the business that I was in, that was an okay contract. It wasn't huge. Yeah. But over, it was a renewal period, like, you know, the, the year of a three year renewal and over a nine month period, we took that. Uh, I, I was mentored by my VP of sales and my mm -hmm. VP of services. And these guys were both like 30 year veterans in the industry. Wow. I basically was their caddy, you know, I was just carrying their clubs. <laughs> But I got to see what it's like to run a, an extremely complex sales cycle with a team of 30 or 40 people at one point. That's just our side, mm -hmm. not even theirs. Yeah. And we ran that up from what used to be a $10 million contract and we turned it into a $50 million contract. Wow. And um, it just completely redefined not only how to sell, but what selling is really all about and its function and its, uh, mm -hmm. its, its level of potential good and service that it can do to the world. And I, why I say that is because some cases are more obvious than others, but when mm -hmm. you can help a sizable enterprise, be it a $300 million company or a 300, you know, a $3 billion company. Mm -hmm. um, when you can help them, when you can really help them move the needle with something that you have and to change or enhance or make more efficient a business process that they have, the impact that that can have on their ultimate customers mm -hmm. is just further levered, right? There's the yeah. solution or service that you have and when you multiply that against the business process that your customer has, that's ultimately going to be levered into their market. It's like double leverage, two levels of leverage. And in, in my case, being in the pharma space, after we did this huge deal, months into it, we looked back and we saw that performance of our customer, we realized that the deal that we did and the system that we put in place helped them speed up how, how quickly how efficiently they and how more much more widely they could bring life-saving drugs to tens of millions of people all around the world. Wow. That's awesome. No, I, and I, I love having that impact and I've, I've experienced that myself. I, I was actually just mentioning to you before we, we got on the air here that I recently closed the largest deal uh, of my career. Yeah. And it's been very rewarding. Uh, I, I'm not quite to mega deal status yet, but uh, I've set that as an intention, as a goal for the next however many years it takes to get there. 
Uh, and that's, that's why I wanted to have you on the show. Uh, but absolutely, it, there's something to be said about the reward, not only the, the monetary rewards that come from closing a, a large scale enterprise deal, but also for the impact that you have on a major company. Uh, you know, in my case, it was a big publicly traded company uh, in the home services space. I won't name them here on the air, but uh, you know, knowing that we're gonna be making a massive impact on their annual revenues this year on their efficiency and some of their operational costs and things like that is just, it's huge and it's very rewarding. And I don't even know if I can put it to words. And so I can't even imagine, describe to us what it, what does it feel like to get a signature on a $50 million order form? And, and it, I guess I'm, maybe I'm naive to the process too. Is it just like any other DocuSign or order form that comes through? Is it just, uh, oh, no. um, I'm sure there's a lot more to it and there's MSAs and, and other paperwork, but maybe walk us through that just because I'm genuinely curious uh, at that point, when you're talking $50 million, what kind of paperwork gets involved and, and what is it, you know, when do you know it's done, I guess is a good question. Yeah, well, so firstly, the first time that we did something like this, let's, let's just say it was before e-signatures were ubiquitous. Right, okay. So take away the ease and, you know, removal of hassle of e-signatures mm -hmm. and remember, yeah. what, I don't know if you even, did, you know, we're doing much business before that, but it was, it was, it was hammer and nail, you know, and, wow. and couple that with, um, oftentimes what happens with really large deals is there needs to be a compelling event that puts a date on the whole process. And mm -hmm. the compelling event that came into ours was the end of the existing contract, which coincided with the end of our fiscal year. Wow. So um we had to basically it's kind of like pushing a size uh, a size 11 foot into a size eight shoe <laughs> it should have taken a year and a half mm -hmm. to we did so much change to the operational model and, and the commercial model and everything that went into this contract it was such a transformation that it should have taken a lot longer but it was kind of like how the, the, the uh, several pharmacists today have accelerated their vaccines to get the COVID vaccines out. You know, vaccines usually take right. five to 10 years. These were done in, in, within a year in, in several cases. So wow. where there's a will, there's a way. And so that's just to set the scene to say everything came down to the last day. Everything. Um, for, and this whole story, by the way, it, not not to plug it too much, but... I've actually written uh, a book about one of the experiences that I, ha that I had with a mega deal because they always come down to the wire. Yeah. And this kind of experience is what comes, shines through in the book. But it, it really came down to um, the procurement guy uh, with 10 different contracts, because the whole deal was about 10 contracts, 10, 10, 10 pieces of paper needed to be signed. Wow. And he had the whole stack. It looked like a Bible. And he, he told me about it afterwards. The executive vice president who had, you know, who had signing authority and knew this deal was coming was in a board meeting that day. And he had to sit in the lobby outside of the board where the boardroom was meeting for like two hours until they took a break. And then the, the EVP came out for a break and he had to pull him aside and say, this is it. And let me walk you through everything. All the contracts were done and he sent it back to me by fax, like, <laughs> you know, 50 plus pages. Wow. And then I had to ship it off for booking and the whole thing got booked maybe three hours before the, uh, the books were, the controller would, you know, close the books on Oracle's fiscal year. It's funny how that works. I, so this deal that I just mentioned uh, came in right before, it was, it was basically Christmas Eve that it came in right on the wire for us uh, before I took off some time. And we were waiting for it and just kind of resigned. I was, you know, resigned myself to thinking, all right, maybe it's just not going to come in before the holidays. Uh, but I, I guess it does come down to that compelling event. You, you have this compelling event in place. And, you know, we're all humans, uh, both, both us as the sellers and, and our buyers are also humans and they're going to wait till the last possible feasible moment to, to wrap things up for the most part, uh, unless, you know, the compel there's a stronger compelling event that, that gets it done before then. But it is interesting how it works out that way. Yeah, it, it, it's a common story. Uh, the proportion might be bigger, but the, the, but the lines are the same. You, you, you've gone through similar experiences for sure. 
Yeah. So I know you, you had, uh, it sounds like to, to pull off that first mega deal, you had some mentoring from some seasoned executives. It sounds like there was a mindset, uh, excuse me, mindset, mindset shift uh, that mm-hmm. took place. And you spoke about this in your webinar, that there was five different shifts that you sort of embraced uh, to, to get you propelled into this seat where uh, these mega deals start popping up more and you're positioned better to win those. T- uh, tell us a bit about that. And I've got some follow-up questions too, but maybe tell us about some of those uh, five shifts that, that you experienced along the way that helped you go from regular old AE working to, you know, working as hard as you can to just barely hit that hundred percent of quota to extreme strategic mega deal closing uh, AE at Oracle. Well, I think I can, I can't, I can generally describe it as like moving through adolescence and into adulthood, Mm -hmm. you know, because in the, in the early days of trying to learn how to do any task, you know, (laughs) sometimes we think we know more than we really do. You know, we might get the first few tasks down and think, okay, I've really got this. But then the, the further over the edge that you look, you see that there's a real abyss there and you really don't know anything. And at the basis of these things, the, these five shifts, at the basis of it is a, a rock solid moral code. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and it's, 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 the, it's the most basic principles of human society, especially, you know, the golden rule, treat someone else as you want to be treated, be honest, be trustworthy, you know, just be a stand up person. And for me, those are really, it's really about integrity and authenticity. And I could talk about those forever. And I don't, I mean, in a way we could assume those are kind of obvious, but in another, uh, I think we've all felt the pull of uh, aggrandizing or maybe, you know, making, making it sound like our product can do more than it really can making it sound like we could give things that maybe we really don't have approval to give. And maybe we, you know, we, we plan on giving people bad news a little bit later after a certain milestone has been, re- all these temptations yeah. are real, you know, and, and um, e- even good people have them. But when we commit to this moral high ground, that's the starting point. It's the starting point for real, genuine, and authentic interactions. And then stuff starts to change because uh, I think another thing that most sellers have felt is that change in our person, as soon as we get on the phone and somebody answers, or as soon as the door opens, or as soon as a a meeting begins, we can oftentimes feel the change and we move into Joe sales guy mode. You know, our our voice (laughs) changes a little bit. We get a little cheerier than we really feel. And, you know, we move and maybe we, uh, our voice goes up a little bit in volume and, and we lose kind of that genuine person who, who we really are. We kind of get, get our stage face on. And when we can kind of let all that go and just be the person who we really are, people on the other side, the, the audience seeing us, hearing us, uh, interacting with us can see that, can feel that. So that's a huge shift. And um it partially happened in me uh, when I realized the impact of doing things a different way and also just getting really comfortable when you've, when you've done a pitch or we, when you've had enough meetings and you know, that number gets over some big number like over a hundred or over 200, you go, oh, this is just, you know, let's just be real now. I don't, I don't wanna try so hard that it comes across as anything but real. And that, that's just huge. Yeah, that that part of your presentation really jumped out at me and, and resonated because I, I recently sort of made an intentional shift to being a more authentic version of me. I think for a long time, I, I was an actor when I would jump on a discovery call or a demo call or a negotiation call. It was just, uh, you know, like you said, I'm putting uh, my voice changes. I posture myself a little bit more, you know, more differently than I normally would. And over about the last 18 months, I really just focused on I'm going to be me. I'm going to show up to every call and be a hundred percent real with people. If they think I'm a nerd, that's cool. I don't care. Uh, some people like buying from nerds. And if they think I'm, I'm corny, that fine, whatever. Right. And uh, you know, just, just being me. And then from the integrity standpoint, 
some of the best reps that I've worked with in my career really embrace that. And it's, it's very easy to, like you said, miss, misrepresent maybe a strong word, but, but, you know, frame something or posture your product differently than it actually is. Uh, stretch the truth enough to just silence the objection. And in my experience so far, the reps that are completely blunt, honest with prospects about limitations, uh, about what is and isn't possible seem to be the ones that end up doing the best anyway. And I think what it is, is they build this massive trust with prospects because when you can look someone in the face, well, look someone in the face through Zoom and say, no, we're not gonna be able to support that use case because of this, this, and that. So if, if that's a must have requirement, then let's establish that right now uh, because I don't wanna waste your time and uh, I don't want my time wasted either if this is ultimately not gonna become uh, a partnership. So I think you're exactly, you nailed it with the integrity, just being completely honest about what, if, if any limitations there are, uh, being you know honest in everything that you do with your prospects and being true to that. And then the authenticity, people buy from people they like, that gets thrown around a lot, but it's absolutely true. If you're 100% authentically yourself, eventually you're going to find somebody who wants to do business with you and partner with you because of who you are and what you bring to the relationship beyond just the, you know, the technical solutions and things like that and the business problems that you're going to solve. Uh, they're looking for that strategic partner. And they're looking for someone that they can trust to, to deliver that. And so I love that part of the mindset shift. And I think I used to work with a lot of younger SDRs and inside sellers, and it was just something that wasn't apparent. It's not something that gets trained on. It's something you, you sort of have to figure out on your own and, and make enough observations and witness enough uh, high performing reps to realize, oh, what they're doing is they're being authentic. They're just being themselves. They're showing up to these calls. Uh, they're not worried about the, you know, how they, they market themselves per se. I mean, of course you want to have, uh, you know, a good, strong brand and you want to be someone who has a, you know, a reputation of integrity, but they're just being themselves and they know that eventually they're going to find the right partnership and they're going to be able to, to command the highest dollar amount to help solve the, the business problems that are at hand. So I really love that you touch on that. And I think that's, it says a lot. Uh, and it's something that I've been working on myself. And sure enough, I had one of the best, if not the best uh, performance years of my career this last year, which is pretty nuts to think about, uh, especially considering the, you know, kind of macro situation going on. But a lot of that I, I attribute to just showing up, being myself, being honest about uh, limitations, if, if any, and uh, being honest with prospects and really building that trust such that I could, you know, position myself to, to be the winner of, of a competitive deal cycle. That's great, Jesse. Congrats, man. It's a yeah. great year. Yeah, thank you. So I love that part of it. It sounds like uh, you really just embraced that. And once you did that, it just became easier for you to sit in front of your stakeholders and uh, and get it done. Um, it, it certainly became more morally comfortable, but doing those big deals is never comfortable in any other way. <laughs> yeah. The, everything else can just go kind of hay haywire. But this concept, this, this first shift really spills into the next one, which is all about um, how to work with executives. Mm -hmm. The second shift is really getting, um, uh, if not comfortable with, at least used to the, the language and uh, the dance, right? That, that's done in terms of dealing, uh, dealing with executives on both sides of the table because you need to be very forthright and clear and concise with executives, but they're also hard to deal with just because they're so busy. Mm -hmm. You know, their schedules, the, 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 the limited amount of time, the limited amount of attention, the, the, uh, the high velocity of what their days, weeks, and months are like. Um, to me, I, I was thinking about this before we got on this session if I was going to distill down what really large deals, what comes to mind when I think of really large deals, I think of access. I think of um, when do really big deals happen? When you have access to senior people is one really big one. Another one is um, really big deals tend to happen when there is proof like like tangible proof that your stuff works. 
It's harder to do that with a brand new startup. It's, mm-hmm. it's quote unquote easier to do with a tried and true product, especially when there's two or three really solid products in the market that are competing and, and going for all of the business. Um, uh, and, and then the third piece can often be where there's a crisis. So I've seen these really large deals happen where um, the incumbent falls over in some way. There's some major stress to the system that it, it can't handle. The customer still needs that same function taken care of, but they've lost trust in that incumbent provider. And so they'll do a deal of size with the competition uh, without this lengthy kind of prove out period, because they already, you know, they already know that the competition was worked for the other half of the market. And this wow. one just doesn't work anymore. And they need to do a massive deal to clean up the mess. Interesting. That, yeah, and I think you're exactly right. Those, those opportunities come when you're in one of the few market leading software companies in the space, definitely harder at the early or even late stage startups. But if you're in an established product that's been around for a while and, you know, at that point they know the market uh, because they've evaluated your competitor. And so they're, they're coming in to, to do a deal with you to, yeah, clean up the mess. That's super interesting tactic. Now I want to, but I want to come back to something too, Jesse, because you said, Hey, I had my best year, but I wouldn't consider it a mega deal. I want to offer a flexible definition of a mega deal. Because when I talk about doing large deals and I talk about my own experience, um, that's just super large, you know, but, but it's not so large that there aren't ones even bigger. I know guys that have done hundred, uh, mm-hmm. almost 200, uh, well, actually even bigger, like government yeah. deals or telco deals can get mm-hmm. just absolutely crazy massive, but you don't have to have that many zeros behind your first digit to call it a mega deal. For me, a mega deal is a deal of uncommonly large size. Mm-hmm. So that could be 3x your number. Or it could be 2x what's normal in uh, your space. You know, whatever is uncommon, because not all of us sell very different solutions or services. Mm-hmm. And what constitutes a big deal for you is going to be different criteria. Um, different spend, different margin, uh, different cost of sale. You know, there's so many variables that go into, I, I, I would never say a mega deal has to be at least X amount of dollars or higher. Sure. No, that's a good point. I'm, I'm glad you called that out too, because uh, yeah, it is, it's, it's sort of relative based on, yeah, your industry, your years of experience, uh, the comp- the type of company you're in. Uh, so mega deals is really more of a concept than a specific tangible deal size. It's, uh, you know, how do you, you know, whatever X your current, <laughs> you know, average deal size, or how do you three X your number? How do you, you know, earn an amount of money that you didn't think you could earn that, that type of thing. So it's all sort of on a personal level. So I'm glad you called that out. Uh, and I shouldn't, you know, I'm already thinking big. I suppose that's, <laughs> that's why I'm saying, all right, on to the next one. Uh, got a, the biggest deal I've ever closed in my career done. Now, how do I, how do I double that or triple that? Right. And then from mm-hmm. there, how do I 10 X that? And so that's kind of back to, to what you're saying that a lot of it really does come down to one's mindset. You've got to go out uh, being authentic, having integrity, but also believing that it's possible to, to find opportunities that are, you know, some multiple of what you've been doing by helping these enterprises solve big business problems. Absolutely. And a lot of the mindset is not, it's not just belief Mm-hmm. Like in terms of belief, like, oh, I can do it. You know, I, I can do this. I believe in myself. It's not so much that, although there is that component of it, but it's also a process where you, you look at your accounts, you look at your, like, like your top accounts and you think, which one of these accounts could actually support a mega deal? You know, if I'm selling a solution that's like per user, of a certain stakeholder type, like salespeople or customer service people or something like that, do they have enough customer service people that they need to buy a whole ton of seats, which would justify a large purchase? Mm -hmm. Okay, why would they do it? You know, it's it's like you're thinking backwards into a mega deal because you have to look at it realistically. You can't just go in with belief and hope. 
but you have to have a really good value proposition. And I'll tell you now, your value proposition is not what your product can do. But it's rather the creative way that you can articulate the solution to a problem. And a solution is not tech. A solution is everything that it takes to make the problem go away, which includes tech and includes people and includes a plan and includes risk mitigation. It includes all this stuff that is so far beyond the, the actual tech or the actual solution. That is so good. Cool. I'm writing this stuff down. Uh, you know, I, I think deep down, I, I, I knew that stuff, but it's really cool to hear you put it to words. Uh, and it is, it does, it goes so much more beyond just features and functions in a, in a software application. It really is about the vision, the bigger picture. Uh, and you do such a good job of that. Again, one of the reasons I just love the content you're putting out is because you, you, you know, you, you're able to sort of bring it up to 30,000 feet. It's so easy sometimes, especially if you're in a, uh, where I'm at, I'm in a, you know, kind of a mid-stage startup company and it's easy, it's easy to get focused on features and buttons and, uh, you know, cool tool add-ons and things like that. But you forget that at the end of the day, the selection is going to be based on how well you can present the, you know, the holistic value that your solution can bring beyond just the the buttons and, and features and functions and things like that. So very well said. And, and uh, I absolutely love that. Qu question for you too, on C developing C-level insights or executive level uh, acumen. What are some ways that you know, you sort of develop that. Is there, you know, books you read or does it just come with exposure to working closely with executives? Any advice you can share on how to continue to develop that side of, of one's professional acumen? Um, I would say it's heavily overweighted with just experience rather than reading about it. Um, I, I remember a few specific meetings here and there in my career where you get that rare, uh, very senior person to attend a meeting. And it mm -hmm. really shines when it's a small group. It can also work when it's a big group. But I remember like there was this one meeting in this first big deal that we did where there was nobody but relatively senior executives plus me. I was like, I was like the scribe or something. <laughs> it was just like this fly on the wall. And there was all these other yeah. big shots from my company and from their company. And the way that they talked to each other it was just so clear, so right. simple, so relaxed. You know, it was basically like, so what is it really that you guys are dealing with? That's what the, you know, my side said. And then the customer was like, well, really what it all boils down to is this one really big bottleneck. We haven't found a good way to do that yet. Well, I think we can fix that, but it's going to take this and this and that. Well, if you can pull the resources by this time period, maybe we could do something. I'm pretty sure we could do it, but let me come back to you. It, it was just so simple. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it dawned on me that um, it, now it's almost like a saying I have, which is bigger deals can happen faster when you get the right senior people in the room. Because the, it, the conversations like that can just cut through months of, of the, you know, the information hiding dance that the, the mid-level or lower level people do to kind of box out you as a salesperson from knowing what's really going on because they feel that they need to hide that information because they don't have the authority to give it out. But then once you get to the highest level, they're like, yeah, of course, I, I want a good you know, vendor who could take care of this to know all this stuff because we really got to figure out, can they do it or not? If they can, I want them in here. So just watching this interplay was so incredibly game-changing that now I'm like, well, heck, if it, why would I ever go to a lower or mid-level person if I have the choice just to go rock it up to somebody yeah. who's, who's super senior to start a sales cycle, to begin a process and tell all those people down in the guts of the organization what to do with me and my team. That's so true. Yeah. So much, so much time and, and calories get burned just playing the, the mid-level management sort of 
I don't want to call it politics, but that's probably what it is to be blunt is it's everyone just putting artificial stamps and stops on things. So that makes perfect sense going all the way up to, to the very top, to the decision makers, and then managing the deal cycle from there. And it goes down to, to the folks that are on the mid-level uh, management side of things. Uh, that is, it's, it's so true. And it does, it seems like it does speed up those, those deal cycles. Um, random question. What, uh, you know, for a couple of these large scale deals that you've done, what was the time frame from start to finish? Uh, if you can remember, uh, you know, start to finish from the time that you started conversations with the team to deals wrapped up and, and signed off on. The shortest one was about nine, nine months. That's crazy. Wow. The longest one was three years. Three. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's, it seems pretty common, especially when you're working on large, lots of stakeholders, lots of moving parts, but nine months is really fast. Cause I feel like there's probably someone out there working nine months on a, on a, you know, very transactional deal in some cases, just trying to get that, that momentum going and trying to get the, the right, like you said, the right leadership bought into the project to the point where it's uh, it's a green light and it moves along. Yeah, I, I guess I did another one in about six months. That was a five million dollar deal, like a like a million years ago. So that was that was a pretty big deal. But yeah. um, that was you know an RFP comes out, they know they need a new system to replace an old system, and it's for across the enterprise. And so they're just gonna sign something with somebody with by the by the end of the RFP process. So yeah, I, I would say six months to years. <laughs> is a is a wide enough range to quote and you just reminded me i wanted to ask you about rfps because i you know i've, I've mostly been in earlier stage startups and rfps are are a dangerous use of one's time in a lot of cases especially if you're not in one of the market leading software companies yet uh any you know any tips you have on doing how do i ask this any tips on making your rfp great or better than anyone's anyone else's that's that's participating or do you think a lot of it comes down to just you know maybe they, their decisions already made and they just want to look at everything side by side before they advance on to the next stage anything you can share there would be super helpful because we get a lot of rfps and we sit and debate on is it worth our calories and time to to go after this one uh or you know we've got to participate because we want to make sure that we're out there and and on the table we have a seat at the table but are we just cannon fodder so they can go and choose another solution that they'd already selected months ago and this is just a formality um it's asking questions around that very concern and, and yeah. you could want or you could do what a really good cross-examination expert can do and ask questions from it's basically asking the same question from different perspectives to shake out the, the real truth. Um, yeah, all kind of, basically a whole bunch of questions on why, why should we respond to your RFP? Mm. So it, it goes along the lines in terms of how long have you been preparing for this RFP? How, uh, have, how, how long have you had conversations with other vendors before there was an RFP? Um, uh, how big is the decision-making group? Does it come down to a person? Does it come down, you know, is it going to be the users? Is it going to be the executives? A and it's, it, you could, I would ask so many questions in that upfront process that probably the person on the other end of the phone would get a little, might even get a little frustrated with it. <laughs> yep. But it's, it's, it's that kind of care that I would take with my time because so few RFPs. So now RFPs have become, standard operating procedure regardless or if there's a just by order of magnitude like the amount of dollars that they think they're going to need to go do something now more than ever they're doing rfis which is just to do a market survey on prices and features and functions across an industry uh, mm -hmm. across the vendor ecosystem etc so so much of this stuff has been built in a standard operating procedure. If everybody did it, you'd be doing nothing but answering those. So then you got to spend right. a lot of time figuring out it, is it worth it or not? And I would, I would say, unless you've been talking with them before there was ever the thought of an RFP, it probably doesn't make sense to respond 
because more and more they've already made a decision. Now, part of the buy-in process includes doing an RFP. They're not doing it because they really want to see the alternatives. They're doing it because procurement tells them they got to go get three quotes. Right, right. That's what I've experienced. And I have, I've seen a lot of RFIs lately, just as a standard procedure. You know, we, we need this information. We're looking at X number of others, but we, we need to know that if this does this and if it's possible to do this on your platform and so forth. So yeah, very interesting. Yeah, it's a, uh, it, it, it's a rat hole. Um, <laughs> hopefully you're not in, in, in the place where you have to do RFPs for every one of them. And uh, here, here's another thing that I have not mastered yet that I'm trying to learn the art of mastering is how to say no. No, I won't respond. No, I won't do this. No, I won't do that. Or no, I won't, but we could do this other thing. I, I, one of the masters, uh, a person that I used to work with, um, she became, I, I, I asked her, I said, what, what do you do that's maybe different than what other people do when it comes to finding the starting point? for doing really large deals. She says, well, I just get comfortable being uncomfortable. And I'm like, oh, what does that mean? And she said, um, I find that the people with whom I do really large deals, the beginning of our relationship is like acrimonious. It's like really hard because I challenge them so hard. Yeah. You know, she was like, well, one of the cases a big deal that I did, um, I was asked to respond to an RFP. And we read through it and I, and, and I, as politely as I could, I said, thank you so much. And I know you're coming to us because we're kind of one of the biggest players in this space. We're not going to respond. It doesn't make sense. And here's why the way that it's been written is not going to bring you to success. It's just not. And we've seen enough of these to know. And I'm, and, and she could see that the, 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 the project leader on the other end was just about to freak out because they really needed this vendor to be a part of it because they were such a serious player. And she said she wasn't going to do it mm. unless all these other things happened first, that she was given access to people and that she could tell a story a different way. And then she could say, we, 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 we will not respond to this RFP, but we would respond to something else if these other things are taken care of. And in the beginning, the relationship with the project manager was really tested because it blew up his work fourfold. Wow. But by the end of it, she got a massive deal out of it. And not uh, only that, the guy moved to another industry player and did, I think, two more massive <laughs> deals with her because of such a, it was a genuine relationship, right? She, she genuinely is like, this is not going to, this is going to be two years of work and then you, it's going to fail because of the way you guys are setting it up. Hmm. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, you really got to put that, be able to live with the tension of saying no. And then good things happen sometimes on the other side. It's so true. It, one of the, some of the hardest calls that I'm on are, you know, contrary to popular belief, the hardest calls aren't like price negotiation calls or discuss, you know, d demo calls or anything like that. The hardest calls that I'm on are the ones where we have to tell someone this isn't a good fit uh, or this isn't worth either of our time. And I get a lot of those. We get leads where I'll end up on the phone with somebody and it's, and we're, we're probably not the best solution for you, but it's hard to turn away uh, an opportunity, at least, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a mental opportunity. And it's hard to tell somebody, no, no, we're probably not the right technology partner for you. Uh, and then it's also hard to say no, because I think most of us as sellers are pretty much, yeah, for the most part, we're optimists. And so it's hard to say, you know, no to, to, you know, this opportunity or that, or it's hard to say no to this suggestion or that. It's just, yeah, yeah. You're exactly right. That learning the power of no is one of those things that if you can master it, you can free up a lot of time, uh, a lot of mental energy as well. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of goes back to that being fully authentic too. You can kind of be authentic to yourself. And if it's not something you actually want to do, say no to it, uh, and, and move on and focus on the things that are going to move the needle for you and make the most impact act. Absolutely. You got it. Awesome. Well, I know we're, uh, I, I said we were going to go an hour and we're coming up here towards the, the end of that hour. I really do appreciate uh, you taking time to, to come on the show today. 
Uh, before we wrap up though, I did want to give the audience an opportunity to find your content. So uh, here's a chance for you to sort of share how we can find your, your best content, your website, your uh, LinkedIn. How can folks get in touch with you? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you'll just give my name in the, in the, in the show notes. So you can yep. just look me up and follow me on LinkedIn. That's where I do most of my posting. Indeed. And then um, for the, for the coaching work that I do, uh, it's uh, megadealsecrets.com. Mega, not make a deal. Mega deal. <laughs> Chris. Com. Mega and deal. Uh, I have a, yeah, I, I, I do coaching for really ambitious reps and teams. Uh, and we can work together for a quarter or we can work together for a year. And um, a lot of reps that I work with tend to get mega deals within 12 to 18 months after they uh, work with me. So that's something that gives me a lot of a lot of pleasure. I, I just love to be around big deals, whether I'm running them or helping with them, but it's, it's so much fun. Awesome. I will post links to this uh, in the show notes. And just to, to reiterate, one of the things you talk about a lot is finding mentors, finding, uh, you know, mentorship, and that can be really hard. Uh, I know I've, I've been very fortunate that I've landed in some roles where I've met some fantastic mentors and I have a nice group of ongoing uh, you know, mentorship and, and mentors that I can reach out to whenever I encounter a, a blocker mm. or even a life situation that I don't know how to deal with. And so for anyone out there who's looking to, to take it to the next level and find their first mega deal or, or their next mega deal, uh, definitely check out Jamal's, uh, you know, mentoring and, and his master classes and, and other programs out there. So I'll certainly put links in the show notes to, to how to find those resources. And of course, uh, send a, an invite to connect with Jamal on LinkedIn. And uh, with that, uh, thanks again, Jamal, for coming on the show. Thanks, Jesse. It's been fun. 